Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're looking at the Stamina Warden for the Stone Thorn patch and probably also the Mark Path patch then because as far as I've seen so far from the PTS changes it's not going to be too big of an impact on them if all they're getting stronger than they are now which is nice because Stam Wardens have needed a little buff for a while but we'll see that when it comes out that's all just PTS so none of that is carved in stone yet. All right, let's quickly pop a potion and look at our character sheet here. We've got about 10k max magicka, 18k max health, which is pretty good. Uh, 34k max stamina, which is also very good. Uh, close to 1,300 stamina recovery, which is nice. And then weapon damage of 3,500, though that will go up with our glyphs and sets we're using to over 4k. And then 56... Uh, 0.2% weapon critical, which allows us to use the Shadow Mundus Stone, increasing our critical damage done by 17%. I'm using Flat Food here, which just gives me max uh, health and max stamina on this one. So that's just any of the blue CP150 foods that will give you about 5k max health and max stamina. They come in a couple different names. Um, this one's called Sticky Pork and Radish Noodles. And then obviously we're using the Essence of Weapon Power, which grant us Major Brutality to increase weapon damage, Major Savagery to increase weapon critical, and Major Endurance to increase stamina recovery. It also restores about uh, 7,500 stamina immediately. Now we'll go right into the skills. And uh, since we're only using skills from the Animal Companions and Fighter Skill skill lines, I'll quickly go into the passives here first because it's important to understand why we're using so many of them. Bond with nature. Anytime one of your animal companion skills ends, you are healed for 1,200 health. Savage Beast. When you cast an animal companion's ability while you are in combat, you generate 4 ultimate, and this can occur every 8 seconds. Flourish. Increases your magic and stamina recovery by 12% if an animal companion ability is slotted. And then Advanced Species. The damage one increases your damage done by 2% for each one slotted, so that's 8% on the front bar and 4% on the back bar currently. As you can see, all of these are very good. You can heal yourself, you can generate ultimate like crazy, you've got stamina recovery, which is very good for your sustain, and your damage is improved. And then on the Fighter's Guild one, this one just makes your Fighter's Guild skills cost 15% less. This one, however, increases your weapon damage by 3% for each one slotted, so that's at the moment 6% on the front bar and 3% on the back bar. And then Banish the Wicked, generate 9 ultimate when you kill Undead, Dead or Werewolf, plus also your Fighter Skilled abilities deal an additional 20% damage to Undead, Dead or Werewolves. So these are very important, and that's uh, mostly the reason for all the weapon damage and damage done, why I'm using so many of these skills here. Alright, first off is our spammable, and that's Cutting Dive. You command a Cliff Racer to dive bomb an enemy, dealing 8500 physical damage, and when you're more than 7 meters away, you can also set the target off balance and then further increase your damage. Plus the distance the bird travels also impacts on the damage it does. Pretty much looks like this. The bird just comes flying down and there you already saw off balance proc and then it does damage. Optionally, if you don't want to use the bird, if you're always in the face of the enemy and you're doing melee damage only, you can also use Rapid Strikes from the Dual Wheel skill line as a spammable. This will uh, batter them with 5 consecutive attacks, each dealing 1400 physical damage. And each hit increases the damage of the subsequent hit by 3%. The final one deals 300% more damage. So this is about they're about as, as strong. Um, I prefer the Bird because it's faster to cast and I can also cast it from range. But if you like Rapid Strikes, if you don't like the Bird, it's totally okay to go with Rapid Strikes in that slot as well. Next up from the Fighter's Guild skill line is Barb Trap, so last thing you unlock. Starts with Beast Trap, morph it to Barb Trap, and this puts a trap down for 18 seconds, uh, which deals physical damage over time, but more importantly grants you minor force, increasing your critical damage by 10% for the whole duration. Um, enemies who activate the trap are immobilized as well, but that's not so important. This just looks like this. Put a trap on the ground, and if an enemy steps into it, they're being immobilized for 2 seconds, and uh, they also... Uh, take damage over time and grant you the minor force which is so important for our critical damage. Next up also from the fighter skill skill line is Camouflaged Hunter. Starts out as Expert Hunter. We're not actually using this skill um, but it is nice because when we have it slotted we get the passives from the fighter skill that I just showed you. And then while slotted you also gain Major Savagery um, and Minor Berserk. 
if you are attacking from enemy's flank, increasing your damage done. So it's pretty much just there for the fighter's guild passives, really, to be honest. The next thing, however, is very important, and that is Subterranean Assault. Starts out as Scorch. And what this will do is it will stir up a group of sharks that attack after 3 seconds, dealing 13k poison damage, and enemies afflicted with minor fracture, um, reducing their physical resistance by 5k. So usually the tank already puts minor fracture on the boss by stabbing him with pierce armor. Um, but this is nice for ad pools anyway, because if there's if you say you're starting out in Hellra and there's all these ads, hundreds of them, uh, the tank is not going to be able to stab every single one of them. However, you can just cast your shocks, and after three seconds they will come up, and all the enemies in front of you will take damage and also be afflicted with the minor fracture, so you can burn out groups faster. The next thing we've got is also very important in terms of the debuff it gives to the boss. It's Growing Swarm, also from Animals Companions. And what this does is it will unleash a swarm of fetcher flies that stays on the target for 11 seconds. Probably goes up if you level the skill up. I don't know why I still haven't done it, but oh well. And what's very important is it will put minor vulnerability on the target, increasing the damage taken by a percent. So this is why usually you have Warden Healer in the group. They can put that on them and put the minor vulnerability in the boss, increasing their damage taken by 8%, which is quite a big thing if you're fighting a big boss in a veteran trial this is, that has millions and millions of health. However, you can also take over, and you have that as well. And, um, yeah, enemies near the carrier of the flies then also take damage, by the way, so it's a little bit of AoE as well. just looks like this. You put this swarm fly on the target taking damage continuously and then above its head you can see the little green fly buff that is your um, that is your fetcher flies and then next to it the minor vulnerability so just make sure you always have 100% uptime on this skill last but not least the wild guardian the bear uh, it just continuously deals physical damage sometimes it does a big swipe to all the enemies in front of it, dealing even more damage. And then once it's summoned for 75 ultimate, which is very cheap, because we already uh, get so much ultimate back from the Animal Companions passive, and if we're fighting Undead, Dead, or Werewolves from the Fighter Skill passive. So you can pretty much cast this every second rotation. Uh, it will do a huge uh, attack for 15k damage. Plus, it's also 100% uh, more damage to enemies below 25% health, so it's very strong in Execute. We have to double slot the bear, because if we wouldn't, it would go away every time we swap to a back bar, which would not be very handy. So for the back bar, first thing we've got is Consuming Trap. This comes from Soul Magic. That's the skill line you level up while doing the quest, the main quest in the game. And this will do magic or physical damage, in our case physical damage, 12k over 10 seconds, because the damage dealt is based off a higher offensive stat, which obviously is uh, stamina so physical damage and then um, you also restore 2k magicka and about 7k stamina if you uh, uh, if an enemy dies that had the soul trip on them so this is scaled off of our max health magic and stamina as well it's a very nice skill for sustain especially in ad pulls and all that but it's also pretty good damage over time so it's a good one to have there next up is a sustain skill plus a cleansing skill that is the bull natch starts out as batty natch morph it to bull natch that's a stamina morph which will restore 5k stamina to you over 25 seconds give you major brutality and sorcery we already get that from our potion but in case you forget to pop your potions or you're just running normal trials and you want to be cheap and use stamina pods um that'll be okay then if you have the bull natch up at all times Plus, every 5 seconds, the net removes one negative effect on you, which can be very nice if you're in a dungeon or a trial where there's a lot of poison or fire or bleed or something around. Um, which pretty much is there in all of them. <laughs> Alright, next up is our heal. That's from the Assault skill line, so you have to play a bit of PvP. It doesn't matter which morph you choose. Uh, it's called Vigor. Morph it to either Echoing Vigor, Echoing Vigor or the green one. This one heals your allies as well. The green one is a bit of a stronger self heal, but it only heals yourself. So with this one, you can heal the targets around you in that circular thing that you just saw. Um, reason I went for Echoing Vigor on Stamina Warden is because 
our animal companion skills heal us, our Bettinage heals us, this skill which we're getting to also heals us. So there is enough self-healing around to be able to use the group morph and uh, give everybody in the group a little bit more healing as well. Or you can help them out if you see that they're struggling and they don't have a self-heal equipped or something. Alright, so our big AoE from the bow skill line is going to be Endless Hail. I used to run the other morph here, hence it's not leveled up. Just changed that recently. Uh, launching multitude of arrows into the sky dealing physical damage to enemies in the target area every one second for 10 seconds after a two second delay. It's pretty simple, just looks like this and everybody in the circle where the arrows are hailing down will take damage. It's also important for our back bar weapon then because that will boost this skill. Next up is from the fighter skill skill line yet again, Ring of Preservation. This puts a rune on the ground and you and your allies in it gain minor protection and minor endurance reducing their damage taken by a percent and increasing their stamina recovery by 10%. Plus, you're also healed by 500 every half second, so by 1k every one second, and it lasts for 8 seconds. Just looks like this. If you know there's a lot of damage incoming, we do not actively use this unless we need a heal or some extra protection. But if you are, for example, in Execute phase in Cloud Rest or, or, or uh, Sanctum of Fidia or anywhere really, uh, it's helpful to drop it down because everybody around you as well will get the minor protection too. Plus you'll get some self heals as well then. Alright, so much for the skills. Let's quickly look at the other passives. We've already talked about the animal companion ones, very important. These ones here are not important at all except for the last one. When you activate a heal on yourself or an ally, you grant them minor toughness, increasing their max health by 10% for 20 seconds. And we do activate heals on ourselves for sure. We also activate heals on our allies by using the Echoing Vigor Morph. So this is the only important passive. All of the other ones only work if you are using green balance abilities, which we are not. I've got a couple here leveled because I sometimes play PvP on this character and then they come in quite handy. Um, but you actually just, if you only play PvE, you only need the last passive here. And then Winter's Embrace. Uh, Increases your chance of applying chilled. For this patch, not very important for you. Next patch, we'll have to see when ice damage does the minor brittle thing. Um, if eventually you could even use something like impaling shards on a on a stamina warden, and then you'd need that passive as well. But that that's all PTS talk that remains to be seen. So there's not really any point. However, try and get all of these skill lines up to 50 if you're just starting out with a warden it's gonna be worth it at some point because the game just keeps changing and changing and maybe one of these heals will be super strong in, a, in one of the next patches or maybe we'll do ice damage who the fuck knows so um, yeah that's about that uh, this one is quite good reduces the effectiveness of snares applied to by 15% so I'd definitely get that and then increase your uh, magic and frost damage that's not too important right now because we're not doing magic or frost damage but who knows for the future but as of now icy aura is the only one that would be uh, good for us you want all of the dual wield ones obviously since that's our main front bar weapon and all of the bow ones since that's our main back bar weapon you want all of the medium armor ones since we're running five pieces of medium armor or seven pieces that is your choice completely so as you can see from these passives you get more weapon critical more stamina recovery um, and more weapon damage. These values would go up slightly if you were wearing seven pieces of medium armor, so that would be uh, that would lead to an increased damage output, just a tiny bit, but it would be more than it is right now. Or you can run five one one like I am right now, so five medium, one light, one heavy, and then you'd get a little bit of extra um, spell resistance and magical recovery from your light piece and a little bit of extra physical and spell resistance, health recovery and maximum health for your heavy piece. Plus also the undaunted skill line where it increases your max stamina, health and magicka by 2% per type of armor uh, that you have equipped so we get full 6% if you run 7 uh, medium you only get 2% and then also activating an ally synergy restores 4% of your max health stamina and magicka so that's completely up to you really uh 
7 medium is more DPS, 1 light, 1 heavy, and 5 medium is more resistances, more health, more armor, and uh, also more stamina and magicka from your undaunted passive, undaunted metal. That just totally comes down to how you want to play your character. If you're going to be in trial situations, you don't need all these resistances. You pretty much only stack at the boss and try and burn it. Uh, 7 medium is definitely more damage, as I said before. But if you're also running solo content, farming content, sometimes without a healer or something, I just prefer having a bit extra health and resistances um, with the 1 light and 1 medium piece. But that's completely up to you. Fighter's Guild we already talked about, Undaunted we talked about, you don't need anything from Assault or Support, obviously you want your uh, Racial skills, and then Alchemy the Medicine and Use one to uh, make your potions last longer, so they can actually have 100% uptime. Now for the race, Wood Elf is not the top damage choice, I'll tell you that right now. The reason my uh, Stam Warden is a Wood Elf is because I do run each class on Magicka DPS and each class on Stamina DPS on my account and I don't want all of my Magickas to be High Elves and all of my Staminas to be Orcs which would be the top, dam top damage choices because that is just boring um, so yeah pick and choose your main characters if this was your main character go for an Orc probably because it is the most damage and it gets a little bit more health as well so you could run the dubious Cameron Throne that is actually an important thing to say here. If you were an orc on this build, which is more damage, go for this food, which increases max stamina and max health, and also stamina recovery, because you already get more health for being an orc anyway, and you don't get the recovery that a wood elf, have, wood elf has, so you probably want to run Dubious Cameron Throne on an orc, and not the flat food, because you'd need the extra bit of stamina recovery on an orc. Reason why I'm a wood elf, pretty much extra stamina recovery which is very nice and an extra 2k stamina which is very nice plus the penetration since as I've mentioned before I take this character into PvP now and then so it comes in quite handy plus you're also faster as a wood elf as well um, for the races in general top damage choice orc second a bit behind it is probably dark elf and then comes Khajiit and then comes wood elf and red guard and stuff like that so yes, I'm not one of the top damage races here, but it doesn't matter, I can still hit like 75k or something on the big dummy, which is good enough for most of the trials anyway, with this setup, and that is not even the optimal damage setup as well, which we're getting into now. We are using Briarheart, Dagger and Axe on the front bar, and Jewelry. It doesn't matter if you have the Dagger or the Axe on the front bar, the only thing that matters is that if you have the main hand weapon, so the first one is in Nernhond, and the second one is in Sharpened. And then your jewelry will all be in Bloodthirsty with weapon and spell damage, uh, no, weapon damage uh, glyphs. On these here, we're using poisons. should probably equip these. Uh, the double dot poisons, they're just called damage health poisons, and they deal two uh, different dots, one less for 3.5. 5 seconds, the other one for 6.3 seconds, and the poisons are applied by light attacks, heavy attacks, and weapon abilities. If you don't want to run poisons because you're cheap, just put a poison glyph and a disease glyph or an absorb stamina glyph on, on these weapons here. It's not too much of a damage loss, but it is a slight damage loss. Uh, okay, Briarheart, why? Because weapon critical, maximum stamina, weapon critical, and when we deal critical damage, we increase our weapon damage by 440. So we already had 3,500 about with the potion on, so we'll get an extra 440 from here, bringing it closer to 4k for 10 seconds. Plus, while it's active, our critical strikes also heal us for 341 health. So it's still very good set, Briarheart. Uh, the weapon damage increase is super cool. Uh, it gives you two crit bonuses, which helps out pushing your crit over 50% to use the Shadow Mundus Stone, and it heals you as well. So this is more of the utility setup right now with Briarheart, but it is capable of pushing pretty good damage as well, so don't underestimate it. However, it is not the top damage option, which I'll show you in a second. Back bar the Maelstrom's Bow with a weapon and spell damage uh, glyph on it in Infused to make the glyph stronger. And uh, that will, well, obviously that will increase our weapon and spell damage by another 400, so pushing it far over 4k. 
and then what this does is it increases the damage of the ticks that volley which is our endless hail do by 430 each tick and uh, every time it ticks up up to eight times so don't get confused by these numbers now if there's exclamation marks behind it it's critical so they're gonna be a lot higher anyway oh we'll just see where it goes so you got 1700 1800 2100 2200 2500 and a whole lot of crits as well. So you see why we're using this bow because Endless Hail just gets stronger and stronger and stronger uh, as long as it ticks with the Maelstrom bow. You do not have to get the perfected one because we literally spend like one and a half or two seconds on our back bar so the extra bonus wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. You can easily go in on normal, farm the normal one, get it to infuse, put the right glyph on, gold it out, you'll be fine. All right. Next set we're running is Relicans. This comes from Cloudrest, gives us weapon critical, minor slayer to increase our damage done to dungeon trial and arena months by 5%, uh, another weapon critical bonus, and then you lighten heavy attacks, apply a stack of harmful winds, which will deal uh, 393 physical damage per stack every one second, and it goes up to uh, 10 stacks. However, you need to light attack every five seconds to keep the stacks up. So as you can see here, there's the wind around the target, and above its head, it's ticking down. So four, three, two, one. And before it has ticked down, you have to apply the next light attack to get your next stack and keep them up. You can push this up, as you can see, inside of the little icon to six stacks, seven stacks, eight stacks, nine stacks, 10 stacks, and that is your maximum damage. And then you just have to light attack every five seconds within your rotation to not let the winds drop off. Because if you do, you lose a whole lot of damage. It's not too hard to keep up. Uh, they changed the set from 20 stacks down to 10 stacks, so it's easier to build them up should you lose them, which makes it more viable for all kinds of content because earlier on you used to have to get all these full 20 stacks back up, which took quite a while. Getting the 10 stacks back up isn't too bad. Obviously, it takes half as long, so it's easier to get your damage back if you shall lose it, which makes it more viable for, for uh, trials and other content, so you can now run this in pretty much everything. Uh, anyway, okay, monster set here, I've got Valley Dreaths. This increases our weapon damage. This comes from Cradle of Shadows, by the way. And when we deal damage, we have a 20% uh, chance to spawn disease spores, which will then deal uh, 14k disease damage, and it can occur every eight seconds. Let's see if we can quickly proc that. Yeah, there they are. These little disease balls here, which will then hit the target. So this is the utility setup so to speak why because i can stay ranged if i want to i've got my bird which i can do ranged i've got welly dreath which will go off ranged as well and um no don't summon there and i heal myself by using briarheart and a variety of my skills this is a very strong setup, don't underestimate it. Briarheart, Valley Dreath, Relicans is still capable of pushing uh, pretty high numbers on the DPS dummies. However, it is not the top damage uh, option which we will go into now, and for that you would uh, you would replace Valley Dreath with Selene's. That comes from Selene's uh, web, obviously, the dungeon. Adds 1k stamina, plus when you deal melee damage, you have a 15% chance to call a primal spirit, so another bear that hits the enemy in front of them uh, after 1.3 seconds for 18k physical damage and it can occur every 4 seconds. So in best case scenario getting an extra 18k physical damage every 4 seconds is stronger than Valley Dreath. However you have to be close to it because it is melee damage that it procs off and the bear that will spawn also will be um, sort of melee damage because it doesn't have a huge range like Valley Dreath does. Another thing here, instead of Briarheart, the top DPS option would be the Advancing Yukita set. So you also wanted the front bar weapon, be it the axe or the dagger in Nernhorn and the off one in Sharpened. This gives you weapon critical, weapon damage, weapon critical. And when you deal melee damage, your weapon critical is increased by 305 for 5 seconds, stacking up to 10 times. So this is currently, and probably also in Markarth, the top DPS set for stamina on most uh, classes and that is what you would go for if you wanted to opt for optimal damage output so the differences to the build I'm running right now if you wanted to go for optimal damage is 
Go with Advancing Yokida Weapons on the Front Bar and Jewelry. Go with Selene's on the head. Go with Orc for a race. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I forget something. No, I don't think so. So these are the changes you could make for the top DPS option, and that's probably what the Markarth build is going to be. However, this is nicer to for survival, for self heals, and all that, and it is capable of pushing almost as much damage, maybe a couple k less than. All right, so much for that. Let's quickly hop into the champion points, and then we should almost be done with this. Seventy-two Ironclad, sixteen Spell Shield, fifty-six in Elemental Defender and Hardy. 51 in thick skin, 19 in quick recovery, 44 in warlord, 75 in each mooncalf and tenacity, 20 in shadow ward and 50 thick, 56 in tumbling, 3 in physical weapon expert, 56 at master of arms, 44 in thaumaturge, 56 precise strikes, 55 piercing and 56 in mighty. The champion points will probably change with Markarth, but I'll most likely do an update to the build when the new patch drops anyway, because there's a couple things that have to be checked. Um, and yeah, so much for that. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have fun playing your uh, your warden. Oh yeah, right, rotation. So it's always sub assault and two skills. You can start out on the front bar with a sub assault. Swap to your back bar. Your only two back bar skills you're casting in your rotation or endless hail and consuming trap back to the front bar sub assault one cutting dive and the barb trap sub assault one cutting dive and a growing swarm sub assault and swap again so it's always sub assault and two skills in between back bar skills being endless hail consuming trap and the front bar skills being cutting dive barb trap and then cutting dive growing swarm and then when your bear is ready you replace one of the cutting dives for the uh, for the bear. So I'll do it slow. Start with a sub assault, swap bars, endless hail, light attack, consuming trap, sub assault, cutting dive, barb trap, sub assault, cutting dive, growing swarm, sub assault, bar swap, hail, consuming, sub assault, cutting dive, barb trap, sub assault. Cutting dive, growing swarm, sub assault. Now, since this is a very fast rotation, you technically only need to cast barb trap every second time, since at least it lasts 18 seconds. So you'll have almost no downtime on it. Uh, so what you can do is, in the first time around, do the barb trap, and the second time around, just do two cutting dives. But it's not too much of a damage difference. So, um, but yeah, it is an option definitely. Okay, also the bear, I didn't show that right now, let's start it again, sub assault, hail, consuming, sub assault, bear instead of cutting dive, barb trap, sub assault, cutting dive, swarm, sub assault, swap, hail, trap, sub, cutting, barb, sub, cutting, swarm, sub, swap, hail, consuming and so on and so forth light attack between every skill um, make sure that when you're swapping to your front bar after casting consuming trap you get that light attack in before the sub assault it makes a damage difference um, but yeah that's about it I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I hope you enjoy playing stamina warden I'm really looking forward to the Makath patch when it's apparently getting a buff and getting to be a bit stronger than they were because they were always on the bottom of the food chain so to speak but they are immensely fun to play and yeah if they get better with the next patch that'll just be a great uh, great thing for me and I'll probably play more stem warden again so enjoy this video see you next time